Hello, so let's talk about wide angle zoom, so Canon cameras. So this 16 to 35 f4 has been one of my most favorite lenses for the longest time. I've shot thousands of assignments with it all over the world on my Canon DSLR full frame cameras. Um, now I'm on the road to mirrorless with the Canon R5 and as part of the lens lineup that I was looking at, I've only bought a few lenses for the R system so far, um, but this 14 to 35 caught my eye as something that could be a natural successor to this beast here and I've been shooting with it for the last nine months. I thought now might be quite a good opportunity just to share some of my thoughts and experiences of shooting with both of these lenses. Um, I have shot a little bit of behind the scenes footage which I might just drop in so that you don't have to spend the whole time looking at my ugly mug. Um, and then at the end maybe we'll dive onto the computer and just go through a few of the pictures and just look at them in a little bit more detail. Um, subscribe by the way, still the smallest photography YouTube channel on the planet but it is growing. Um, so I appreciate all of your help and support, thank you very much. Uh, if you want the long story short, they're both brilliant. Um, if you want a bit more detail, Let's dive on in. Okay, so let's talk about money. So this thing is about 1,750 pounds in the UK, new. Um, second hand, you can get it for about 1,200 quid, but there's not that many of them around. Uh, the EF lens is about 1,350 pounds in the UK, uh, but second hand is a bit more of a bargain. Like five, 600 pounds gets you a half decent one. And my advice would be, if you're looking at one of these second hand, is to uh, spend a little bit more, get a decent one. Well, these things have been knocking around for a while, so you want one that's got a little bit of life left in it. There are cheaper options out there that cover this focal range, and there are much more expensive options as well, especially if you want the brighter aperture. Um, and there are an abundance of prime lenses as well that kind of cover the, the focal range-ish. Um, so everyone will have to make their own minds up according to their own needs and requirements. Um, for me, both of these lenses offer a, a sort of reasonable compromise between all of those things that I mentioned. And actually, with a lens like this, because I use it so much in my life as a professional photographer, um, the cost isn't actually the first priority. Just having a tool that gets the job done um, is the main priority. And so everyone will have to make their own minds up according to their own needs. So let's talk build quality. And the 16 to 35 EF lens has been absolutely bomb proof. It's been, I've given it all kinds of abuse over the years and it has never missed a beat. It's been absolutely sensational. And only time will tell whether this thing will follow in its footsteps or not. Only time will tell. But here is a thing that when I bought this, I also got the 24 to 105 standard F4 L zoom in the RF mount. And the other day I had a little drop with that where it felt just a really tiny little distance onto something really quite soft and it should not have been a problem at all. And yet that thing broke like a dry twig and cost an absolute fortune to have re rebuilt. And that does not inspire me with confidence in the RF lenses that much. Although maybe I was just unlucky because you know, over the years I've had a few drops and breaks, not that many, I've been very fortunate, but you know, often it, often things break when you don't think they should break and then other times you'll drop things that you feel, you know, like they should have broken into a hundred different pieces and you pick them up and they're fine. So sometimes luck is involved in those things, but only time will tell, you know, that is the thing, we will see. In six or seven years time, I'll be able to tell you whether this thing is as good as that or not, only then. Now, if you've got any experience of the RF lenses, um, you know, breaking down on you, then, you know, let me know. Be interested to hear. Oh, they've both got weather sealing, by the way, you know, in terms of the build quality. Other than that, they're, they're kind of rather similar, I suppose. This thing feels a little bit meatier, I guess, but, you know, who knows. Okay, so let's talk compatibility. So this is an RF lens, works on the Canon R mirrorless cameras. Pretty much that's it, unless someone can tell me that there's an adapter that makes it work with some other camera system. So if you're a, a, a solely mirrorless shooter, then this is this kind of makes quite a lot of sense. However, if you are an, you have an EF camera as well, or you've got EF cameras like Canon 5D Mark III or IV, or EFSS mount cameras like the 70D or 80D, 90D, then this thing will be compatible with all of them because it's got the EF mount. Also, old film cameras like the EOS 1 or EOS 3, right the way back to the 1990s. Um, this will work with all of them. Also, if you stick this Canon adapter on, it'll work perfectly fine on your mirrorless R cameras as well. And you can get an adapter that probably makes it work on Sony cameras, though I haven't done that myself. So it's very compatible, um, worth knowing. Personally, I've got a foot in both camps. So I shoot mirrorless and DSLR, and so, you know, my life is complicated. We won't go down that road at the moment. Anyway, let's move on. Sharpness and distortion. So I guess we need to talk about the fact that both of these lenses rely upon an algorithmic ninja juju lens profile that 
Canon have kind of liked to have smack onto their files to kind of correct all of the inaccuracies in their lenses. I'm sure other companies are doing it as well. And, um, you know, for me, I'm a raw shooter, so I apply that in post-production and I just leave the little box tipped and it applies the lens profile and it corrects out any of the inaccuracies in the lens in terms of distortion, vignetting and any other nasties that are in there. Um, the purist in me thinks, well, why, why are we doing that? Why aren't they just relying upon lens technology to get better to kind of, so you don't have to correct all of that stuff. But the, you know, the realist in me realizes that these things are doing an amazing job of bending light and the profiles work really well. You know, it kind of works. So I leave it ticked on all the time and don't really think about it from one day to the next. Now, it is quite aggressive with both of these lenses actually, more so with the 14 to 35 RF lens because it's wider. Um, and it can be so aggressive, in fact, that it can steal a little bit of your real estate. So when you shoot wide open on raw, it, the, the lens profile will steal a bit of the edges to correct out all of the inaccuracies. Now, I'm not sure whether that's down to the nature of this lens in particular or down to the nature of 14mm as a focal length, because I have a theory, <laughs> forgive me for this theory, you may not agree, but my theory is that 16mm is kind of a sweet spot in terms of extreme wide angle, that it enables us to kind of capture things and still get a relatively natural feel without distorting too much. As soon as you go wider, you open up kind of a world of Salvador Dali, Bendy Wendy kind of distortion that, that just kind of happens because we're kind of trying to bend light too much effectively, trying to get too much in. Now, even with the corrections applied, this thing is still significantly wider. So if you're using it at that wide end in the real world, let's say you're trying to photograph a really small room, you'll still get much more in with this than you will with the 16 mil. So it kind of is still worthwhile having that extra bit of focal length, even though you're gonna lose a little bit to the, to the profile correction. Um, in terms of sharpness, I've never had an issue with this lens at all uh, over the years that I've used it. Any of the focal ranges or any of the apertures, it just kind of works. And this lens has been exactly the same. It's been absolutely brilliant. It's bitingly sharp, bitingly sharp. Actually, you know, bitingly sharper than this bitingly sharp lens, which is kind of, you know, <laughs> I don't know where else we can go with that, really. Um, yeah, in terms of, I'm not a technical lens chart kind of person, so... I just either have a lens that I like the pictures from it and I think it's great and they're sharp enough and they kind of do the job and then I give it the big thumbs up um, or it's or I see a problem with the lens and then I don't like it um, but for me both of these lenses just get the job done I'm sure there are other resources out there that will give you a bit more of a kind of technical accuracy about whether there's fringing in the purple channels or not you know but that's not really my scene I don't see any fringing with these or chromatic aberration or any of those things um, but that doesn't mean to say they're not there. You just, you know, do your own research if you're if you're bothered by such things. Okay, so let's talk about handling. And the RF lens is a little bit lighter, it's 540 grams, whereas I think this is 600 and something, but with the adapter, it's even heavier still, and obviously bigger, um, longer. Um, whereas the, the negative to the RF lens, if there is one, is that it's ever so slightly broader around the beams, ever so slightly wider. And that can be, you can sort of notice that in real use, especially with a lens pouch. Um, in terms of the overall kind of picture of the lens, they're kind of similar in many ways. The little, the red dot from the EF lens is gone and replaced by some kind of underwhelming little red line, which is really annoying, um, especially when the rest of the lens is ever so slightly featureless, um, because it can be a little bit tricky in difficult lighting. Um, you have three rings on the RF lens as opposed to two on the EF lens. Now this thing, let's take the adapter off, this thing has always kind of struck me as being kind of a bit of a design classic really because you've got your big zoom, big zoom ring at the back, you've got your big focus ring at the front, it's got everything that you could possibly need on it really, your image stabilizer on and off and your autofocus on manual. And it's just kind of like simple, right? It's kind of everything that you need in the lens, whereas this thing is a little bit more complicated. You have your zoom ring at the back, which is with this, has this kind of ridge um, in it, which is fine, but my hand often doesn't, you know, sometimes doesn't find it quite as easily, but that maybe is just evolution. 
And then you have your focus ring, which is kind of hidden a little bit. Now, I'm not a big manual focus guy at all. I don't really, you know, I do occasionally use it, but and it can be quite useful in photography for some people, especially with a wide angle lens, um, especially with a, can a camera like the Canon R5, which finds it difficult to focus in low contrast scenes, like a misty landscape, for example. In, under those circumstances, manual focus can be really useful. And they seem to have forgotten to put the little focus window that you know you've had for a hundred years on all your different lenses which tells you kind of how far away things are. Now I know that they're probably seeing that as progress um, and you can get that information through the viewfinder of your camera but you know there is something that's quite simple about just having a little gauge that tells you how far away things are and it, you know in such again this is a little bit of a dinosaur rant but you know, photography is not that complicated. It's really rather simplistic. And a lot of the camera companies seem to be making gear that actually dumbs down those controls and makes it harder to kind of get to that base level of understanding. Ran over. Um, you also have this clicky, lovely, feel good, clicky control wheel. <laughs> Who would get bored of just kind of, you know, you can just play with that on a, on a Tuesday afternoon. Perfect. However, I have that set to my aperture, which is very cool. You can customize it to, to do lots of other different things. Again, as an aperture ring, it works very well. Apart from it doesn't have the apertures marked on it. You have to kind of get that information through the camera. And again, maybe I'm just an old school dinosaur. Am I? You tell me. Just an aperture ring that tells you what your aperture is just kind of seems to be quite a smart idea to me. <laughs> anyway, each to their own. This is progress. You can get that control through the camera, um, you know, no problem. Okay, focus speed and accuracy and image stabilization and all that kind of thing. Now, both of these lenses are very fast and very accurate at focusing, as accurate certainly as the, as the camera that they're, or the operator that they're being used by. Now, um, I would say that the RF lens is a bit quieter, a bit faster, a bit slicker, just a bit overall, you know, 20% better at all of those things than the old EF lens. That's pretty standard in terms of progression ratios, I guess. But that doesn't mean that this is any bad performance. It does all of those things well. We're talking about stills photography. For video, it's another story. Let's not talk about video. Um, in terms of um, image stabilization, though, they build some ninja stuff into these new cameras. So they're both very good. So when I first heard about image stabilization on a wide angle lens, I was a little bit kind of like underwhelmed. I thought it was a bit pointless, but then having used it with this, with the 16 to 35, it's great. Actually enables some, um, enables you to get some pictures that you'd have struggled with without it. Certainly my experience would tell me that. Now this thing, so I've shot, let's talk about the wide angle lens. So at 16, at 16 mil N, I've shot with this thing down to kind of a quarter of a second before, eighth of a second, quarter of a second. The image stabilization kind of helps you out to get sharp pictures. Now I wouldn't, you know, that's not the I most ideal situation in the world, but sometimes you get pushed into these situations, right? With this thing, holy smoke, the other day I was using it at one second. <laughs> and you might have to take a few frames, but you can get sharp pictures at a second exposure with the image stabilization. You have to take care. Now, <laughs> this is like, you know, this is tempting to do, right? <laughs> this is like putting on your wife's underwear and running around your town on a Saturday morning. You know, it might, <laughs> it might seem tempting at first. But, you know, <laughs> overall, it's probably a bad idea. And at some point, something's going to come unstuck. And that's the same idea as shooting with, you know, relying upon image stabilization to take second long exposures. You know, don't be lazy. Put the underwear back in the drawer and get your tripod out and, you know, and do it properly. Don't rely upon image stabilization when there are other options. <laughs> I don't know quite how we got onto that underwear story, but there you go. Um, not that there's anything wrong with running around the town in your wife's underwear. Um, each to their own, right? Um, having said all of that, image stabilization is enabling us to get pictures that weren't 
simply weren't obtainable a few years ago. So this thing combined with the in-body image stabilization of that R5, just incredible. Um, you know, again, it's worth being aware of the old school rules, but then using new school technology to get the very best from your photography, I guess. Okay, so let's talk about character and feel. Now, um, neither of these lenses... The, so there are other options out there. If ultimate character and feel is what you're looking for in your photography, then there are other options out there. Prime lenses and other, other lenses that will give a little bit more character and maybe better bokeh and some of those things. However, if the, the character that you're looking for is a reliable, rock-steady performer as a wide-angle zoom, then either of these lenses are kind of full of that character. So you have to kind of understand what it is that you're looking for. You know, the other day I was playing with, um, with a, a, a very old prime lens with an adapter on my R5. This lens has been knocking around for God knows how long. I don't know how much it's worth. You know, I know it's a standard lens and it's a prime lens and I was shooting some portraits with it. And oh my God, the character that comes out of that thing is just extraordinary. It's not that technically good. There's a bit of flaring, there's a bit of, you know, dis uh, what's the word? Uh, kind of smudging around the edges, distortion or whatever. But it's got bag load of character in it. Whereas these things don't really have that kind of character because of the nature of what they are. They're technical wide angle zooms that enable you to get the job done. Okay, so here we are with our first frame. This is an interior shot specifically at f4. And this is the uncorrected version on the EF 16mm lens. So if we click onto the next frame, that's it corrected with the profile. So you can see that it's done quite a lot of work to the uh, vignette, but it hasn't really actually changed the optical makeup of the lens that much. It's just done a little bit of correction. So this is uncorrected on the 16mm EF, and this is corrected on the 16mm EF. If we go to the 14mm RF, this is uncorrected. You can see now that there is a lot of um, bendy wendy going on basically and if we correct that lens that's the shot corrected so uncorrected RF corrected uncorrected RF corrected and you can see how it's actually stolen a little bit of kind of frame from around the edges now if we go to the two corrected images and we view them um, side by side you can see that actually on the RF picture over here on the right hand side, there's actually quite a lot more that you can get into an interior frame. It kind of makes a difference, right? Not particularly, this might not be the best example of it, but you know, there is more space that you can get in the file. If we then go into, if we zoom into these files, um, and I've shot specifically uh, F4 here, so that, and I've focused pretty much on this pop, this uh, vase in the middle of the table. And you can see that the actual sharpness of both lenses is kind of similar all the way through from the sort of background here. It's more than acceptably sharp all the way through to here. You can start to see a little bit more distortion on the EF 16mm lens, I would say. The next frame that I want to show you is, um, I particularly want to show it just from the sharpness perspective. Both lenses are shot at... Um, f8 but the light has changed so the exposure is ever so slightly different between them and I got my feet wet so the the composition is a little bit different between them but the thing that I particularly wanted to focus on was just the exceptional sharpness from both of them that look at these rocks you know this is just great the sharpness for this RF lens is just great and then we go over onto the next frame and this is the EF lens and yeah, it's a slightly different composition. The sun's come out, but just look at the sand on those rocks. I mean, it's just exceptional. If we actually go into the background a little bit more, you can actually see that there is more sharpness up here on the RF lens. So it has, because of that 14 mil as well, it has managed to kind of, I think, get slightly more depth of field. The next shot that I wanna show you is a, uh, a self-portrait that I shot at night. Now, the thing that I'm interested in here is not me. Uh, I'm using a light just to light myself up, but it's the light in the background here that I'm interested in actually, of how, so this is shot on the RF lens, and then we go to the EF lens, and you can see, I don't know if you can notice, that the, the sharpness of both is exceptional as well, but just look at the 
um, fall off around here. I'm interested in that because the EF lens is a little bit softer. It has this sort of softer feel to it, whereas the RF lens has this kind of clinical sunburst feel to the to the um, to the streetlight. And that's they're both shot at f/4, and they're both shot 40 uh, mil and 60 mil wide open again. Okay, the next shot is this one, which is our um, our urban explorer at the beach, and this is shot on the 60 mil EF lens. And this is the 14 mil, 60 mil, 14 mil. Now, if we go back to these two and we um, compare them, and we zoom in, and we zoom in a bit more, let's go all the way into the sun back there. Now, these are taken just a few seconds apart. I believe the exposure was exactly the same on them both. Um, and you can see that you know they're so comparable. I mean, there's so that the 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 EF lens is over here on the left hand side, RF lens over here. There really is very little optically between these two lenses, you know. And it might be you could argue all the time that it's actually me that's making any difference that there is between those two frames. Now we have an upright here, which is of a church um, with the moon in the background, and this is shot on the RF lens. And this is on the 16mm lens, so there really isn't very much difference between them. If we zoom in on the moon, this is on the EF lens, and this is on the RF lens. So there really is not much to pull these two lenses apart. What you can see whoops, is the difference in perspective from that 14mm, just kind of it gives that slightly more sort of <laughs> bent back look to the church, I suppose. Um, and the last frame, again, is another self-portrait taken at the church, just to, again to try and sort of get a grip on that sort of lens flare out of focus thing. This is shot on the EF 16mm at 25mm, so somewhere in the middle. I quite often find that I use these lenses at around 24-25mm. And then we go over onto the RF lens, shot at 24mm, so ever so slightly different focal length. Again, the sharpness is biting, but you can see that slightly more clinical um, kind of flare thing going on here, which may or may not appeal to some. It's slightly softer on the EF lens. But, you know, just look at that sharpness. I mean, holy smoke. On both lenses. Exceptional. Anyway, hope that's of some use. So, in summary, I'm not gonna say which one is better or worse because I think they're both just amazing pieces of equipment. And this is, you know, everyone has to make their own mind up about what is right for them in terms of kit. But this is what I will say to you, is that if you're a photographer using either of these lenses, or you have the opportunity to own them or rent them or whatever you wanna do, if you're not getting what you need with these lenses, then it's, da it's on you, it's down to you as the photographer. You're doing something significantly wrong because they're both very capable pieces of equipment and it's, me included, I'm the weak part of the link in terms of all of these things. Um, I hope you've enjoyed watching. Um, thank you very much for your time. Goodbye. Subscribe for Christ's sake! <laughs>